all stations, this is Control. Thank you very much for being here with us. Please don't ask on the chat. It's really difficult for me as I talk to people to go to the chat and then I see a lot of stuff. Um, so the way we used to do it is that someone from the Masa team will pick up the questions and read them out. We don't have that today. So what the only option left to do is for you to actually show your face on video and speak the hell up. So this is an improv session. Okay, so um, when Masa asked me as a follow-up to the Don't Miss Your Corona Crisis Opportunity webinar, uh, which you of course watched from the beginning to end, all of you, twice, um, what could be a very effective follow-up that would be relevant to people? So the answer was, you know, pretty straight up simple. It's going to be biblical analogies in Shakespearean literature and their effect on current Israeli society. But then we decided to go with improv. So um, let's see. Well, by the way, um, it's called improv. But just so you see that we're not bullshitting, um, I did prepare for this meetup. So the message of today is not don't prepare, just improvise and whatever. No, I did prepare. I prepared talking points, but I did not prepare the entire script. There is no lecture. Um, so, you know, I'm showing you what I'm doing. So let's see, what did I prepare for today? Okay, context. So um, this webinar is in a way related to a former webinar called Don't Miss Your Corona Crisis Opportunity. Uh, which is basically me bringing my business unit thinking, putting it on the table. And then a lot of people ask questions about job interviews, about entrepreneurship, about their career path, about Aliyah to Israel, about how to reach out to people during these weird times. Where's the opportunity? Um, a lot of interesting questions. So that was over there. Um, and it's all online, so you can check it out. So today's basically, um, it's supposed to be some sort of a follow-up. I don't want to repeat things that we already discussed, but the way I'm going to approach this webinar is based on my philosophy, which is in today's world of work, we all have to think like business people. Jonathan and Anna and Julia and Jessica and Eden and Leia and Emmanuel and Marcela and Elan, you are all the CEO of you incorporated. That's what the internet is doing, even if you're an employee. So what does that mean? And where does improv comes in? So that's the context of today's session. I'm gonna speak for like 10 minutes. You know what, maybe I'll be fair, 15, 20 minutes, but then I wanna open this up for questions, answers, and practice. If uh, you feel comfortable practicing, it would be the best, but this is not, a um, you know, like in theater when you practice improv and not like the comedy show, the idea is improv with the context of our career. So improv in job interviews, improv in meetings, uh, in the office, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, the other point I wanted to make this, um, let's do it like this. So um, there is a post called the importance of improv in our careers. Can everybody see my screen? You guys see my screen? Okay, great. So it's a post, it's on LinkedIn, it was posted on Times of Israel as well. And that's basically the context of today. So I don't need to read the post because obviously you all read it twice. Um, but I'm just going to go over it quickly. I do need to give two shout outs. Number one, this post was co-written with the amazing uh, Rita Ritvin, who uh, is mentioned here. And she could not join in today, um, but a, a lot of what we discuss here is also from her professional experience. So I want to give her a shout out, Rita Ritvin. Uh, and we met at WeWork, so I want to give them a shout as well. Okay, we're not going to go over the entire post. Um, you guys, I, I don't know if you even know, I mean, anybody here doesn't know Seinfeld? Okay. Who here remembers that episode when George is like, you know, in hindsight, figures out what he should have said? Nobody knows that. Okay, super funny clip, which is the context for what we want to talk about. Watch it later on. Um, dude, you should, you know, fill in for Seinfeld. You missed it because you were too young. Watch Seinfeld. 
Um, so imagine this character that goes into an important meeting and, you know, his colleague is laughing at him. I'm going to shut down this for now. Um, and his colleague is laughing at him. And then, you know, the, George, who is the hero here, um, you know, he's like, you know, choked. He's struck. He doesn't know what to say. And then two hours later, he's in his car and he's like, God damn it, I should have said this. And it eats him up until he, you know, you know, makes a uh, U-turn, goes back because he has to say that thing. Um, and it's done in a very funny way. So watch it. This is something that happens to all of us. We all say to ourselves every now and then, oh, God damn it, we should have said this in meeting. Or, you know, when they told us X, we should have said Y. And in a way, it's the context of why um, uh, improv is important. So George Costanza, who here remembers, you know what, let's put it this way. Anybody here never encountered a situation where in hindsight you said, oh, I should have said this. Who here, you know, who here admits like this happened to you? Who here experienced that? Be honest. What, Julia, this never happened to you? Like in hindsight, a family argument or with friends or a job, I don't know, a business meeting. It happened to all of us, right? Great. So you get stuck or you're afraid to speak up. And then you don't want to show up again because you don't want this to happen again for you. But then you also miss the opportunity to, you know, build a relationship and move the conversation forward. It's true for small talk discussions, you know, friends, job interviews, of course, more. We all know that. Now, in the past, I admit, in order to avoid such situations, I used to prepare a lot for meetings. Not like I prepared for this one with you know, talking points, but like prepare a lot for meetings. I would literally like imagine in my head the screenplay of what I'm gonna say, what people may respond to. And then, you know, it's like an options tree. Like if they say X, what do I say? If they say Y, what do I say? And I used to be like that with job interviews, with business meetings, etc. cetera. Um, and then along the way, a good friend of mine and someone I learned a lot from by the name of Hagai Stern, uh, he taught me not to do it because we're trying to program the situation in order to control it. And it's a mistake, especially because the minute we're thrown out of the screenplay, we don't know what to do. And a better way would be to learn how to adapt and see how, as it goes um, and again, we'll get to situations in a practical way and not try to control the screenplay. So it's important to practice, but you need to practice on how to react to different circumstances, not practice for a specific circumstance. When you say practice, like for example, for a job interview, do you like practice in a mirror or do you just wing it? So we'll get to that. So here's one. How many people here have encountered the advice of, you know, thinking that you'll get asked, what are your pros and what are your cons? What are you good at and what are you not good at? You know, have a ready-made answer for that, right? Great. So you think about what you should say, and then you come to the job interview and they ask something completely different and you're, you know, you don't know how to reply. So mirror or not mirror, we'll get to that because that's more of how to do it. It's not what to do. The idea is prepare for situations and leave them open to respond to the what's happening in the room don't try to program the situation by the way even if there is something you really want to say and it wasn't asked there's a way to move the conversation to say what you want to say um so there's that and elan we'll get to uh the practice a little bit later um other important point so i used to do it i stopped why is this important okay so i'm trying to connect to your world how many people here are currently MASA participants? Hands up. Okay, how many people here are uh, alumni, former participants? Okay, Anna, Jessica, Nat, Leia, I would really appreciate if you're willing to show up your face so you could at least do that thingy. Um, so if you were try to go back to your MASA experience, or for those of you who are in it right now, I'm guessing you had some sort of an Israeli culture immersive 
practice, right? Like how to behave at the office, right? Or, you know, here are the top 10 things you should know about Israeli war culture. Yes or no? Did you have something like this in the beginning of your program, in the middle of your program? Yeah? Okay, I see some nodding faces. Okay. So you had that, which is important. I mean, it's how to fit in and how to be Israeli with Israelis. And we could teach, we could study that and it will be effective. But then the next month, we're being sent to Romania, and now we need to work with Romania. So what, every time we'll learn that to specific different cultures, or maybe there's a way to make it universal, so we learn how to adapt quickly and not how to adapt to a specific culture. Plus on Masa, you don't really have a lot of time, so learning how to adapt to situations is effective, not just adapting to a specific situation. That's why improv is important. Um, another point which was raised, um, it is something that is good to practice, but there's also a part which is pretty much like bicycle, meaning when you kind of get it, then you kind of get it, and then you basically practice without even noticing because you use it all the time. The analogy we use on the post is the chameleon. So a chameleon changes its colors with regards to the environment, um, it learns the color and then learns to adapt to that color. So you don't need to teach the chameleon every specific color. Um, so that's basically that. And no, when you change your color, you do not change who you are. You need to be you. The chameleon stays a chameleon when it shifts from yellow to green, but it's from a yellow chameleon to a green chameleon. So that's the analogy. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about improv. Um, the rest, you can read it on the post. So unless someone wants to ask, I don't know, a hypothetical theoretical question, um, I want to get to the more uh, practical side, share a few tips, um, and move to practice. Any questions about generally improv, what it is, and why is that important? Okay, great, no questions. So, in the post, let's just get rid of it so I can shut my screen down. Um, okay, you see my screen, right? Awesome. So, in the post, we kind of talk about it, improv, yada, yada. I basically gave you some of the points right now. Um, is it really local? No, it's universal. What is improv in business and life? Well, it's a lot. Um, if you take my approach of thinking like a business unit, then improv is a key sales tool. And since we are all business units, we need to learn how to sell, sell ourselves to our boss, sell ourselves in the office. Not sell in a sleazy way, sell in a good way. Um, what would be the difference between improvisation and acting? When you're acting, you're um, trying to, um, from a conscious place, put yourself into a character character which is not you when you're improvising you're in a way still you i mean of course in theater you can improvise by getting to character but what i'm talking about is learning how to adapt to different situations without freaking out and you know get a, a, a you know a blackout so you're still you but you would not be the same you if you interview for a japanese company or if you interview for an israeli company right Yes, no? Who asked? Jonathan? No, I asked. Oh. Okay, you repeat to your last question? Yeah, sure. I just don't see you because I'm sharing my screen. Who is it, Ilan? Yeah. Uh, okay. So basically, that is my answer. When you're acting, you're acting someone. When you're improvising, you're still you. Yeah, but um, I don't know, from my experience, based on improvisation, like it hasn't really worked out very well. Okay, which is why it's something that needs to be practiced. And the way I would improvise and the way you would improvise would be different because we're different human beings. But there are some tricks or some hacks um, that are pretty basic and I want to get to them. But the okay. idea is to improvise in real life situations, not improv sessions where you do get into character. Is that clear? Okay. So I hope no one is confused like you wanted to get some theatrical 
improv skills for your theatrical career? I mean, it's less that. It's more, you know, for job interviews and business meetings and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, great. So, yeah, the chameleon, yeah, da, 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 da. A key improv practice for your career. Okay. So, again, this post was written with Rita Ritven. Let's just give her the respect. So, that's the person. She's not here in Israel anymore. She's back in Miami. Uh, so, she helped me write this post. Thank you, Rita, uh, back here. So, uh, let's start with one practice, which is very good from what I came to learn in team meetings. This could be in your next Massa Leadership Seminar. It could be in a team meeting in the office, in the internship, and so on and so forth. So a lot of times, you know, someone would say something, and some people may react in a way that is kind of like, eh, well, no, because. And even if the answer is no, because, you want to frame it in a way that is, well, yes, and blah, 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 blah. Um, I can tell you that from a leadership perspective, it's a very effective tool to create a positive atmosphere to, to help people collaborate with you more. So Rita talks about it here in, in the post, so I don't want to spend time on that. I actually want to move on to different things, but that is the post. Okay. Another um, um, key point I want to get to, um, which I learned from the amazing Leo Shoham, who is a great storyteller and a consultant. Um, so he taught me to um, say, you know, you know, this is good, but blah, 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 like when you give feedback. And one of the keys that promote a discussion that uh, um, uh, creates positivity, and it's, I'll show how this is related to improv, is not to say, yeah, you know, it was good, but blah, 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 to say, listen, it was great, but it could be greater if. So again, I'm starting with key points that do not change who you are, do not change what you say. It's in how you lay it over. So yes, and, and great to greater. Um, another key point before we move into practice, and I want to hear from you, like real life situations, uh, job interviews, in the internship, and so on and so forth, and uh, 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 actually practice. One more key point, which I'll use in the practice, is what I call to go meta. Um, anybody here knows what meta data is? Okay, Jonathan, um, tell us, what is meta data? Uh, that is data on data. So. Meaning? What do you mean data on data? Um, it depends on what you would need to use it for. Uh, for example, I might want to know how censuses are taken. So rather than looking at a census, I look at multiple censuses to see more about them. Correct. Or let me try to use a more general uh, uh, um, analogy. Tell me if I'm right. Let's say you have a database with 120 entries. So the fact that you have 180 entries is information on the database. So it's data on the data, right? It's used a lot online and so on and so forth. So go meta means provide data on the data. Let's say you're in a job interview and they ask you a question and you need some time to think. So a lot of the times I would say, you know, it's an interesting question. Last time I was asked about this, I actually thought about X, Y, and Z, but I kind of want to tell you right now that it's A, B, and C. So you provide information about what's happening behind your scenes, uh, you know, behind your head, uh, which buys you time and also creates uh, trust and openness. So go meta means share with the person who asked you a question or who wants your opinion. Um, what is your thought process like? I'm going to use that in the example. Um, anybody here may know the term break the fourth wall? Okay, Jonathan, someone else now. Who here heard the term break the fourth wall? I did. Julia. You watch, uh, can see it in all the shows and comic books. You know, which one the character turns and talks to the, to the audience. Right. So I don't know if it's right or not. I, someone told me like this goes back to ancient Greece, um, 
where um, you know the one of the characters would go to the audience, like think about you know the climax of the um, uh, the show, the play, um, and the actor, you know, it's it's the heat of the moment. It's you know a lot of tension. And the character would now look at the audience and say, "Dear audience, what do you think I should do as the main hero?" You know something like that, meaning, let's acknowledge the fact that this is a play, this is you know a theoretical play, and I'm the actor and you're the audience that's some, that is sometimes that that is something that is very effective on job interviews and team meetings. Um, it's kind of related to go meta um, it's to break the fourth wall. Um, meaning share with the interviewer or your boss or the other person the context. I mean, look, right now we're in a context of a webinar, so ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, and share that context, um, and it allows you to improvise. Another thing that I try to use, I don't impose it, but I use it a lot. In every specific conversation, meeting, job interview, or in my case, you know, when I sit with a customer or a potential customer, try to agree disagree and at least at one time say I don't know so you don't always agree you don't always disagree and you don't always don't know but if you show I don't know I would say 50% agree 30% disagree at 20% I don't know you allow yourself to build trust so you don't want to impose that um, but you do want to use that and the last thing I would share before I literally open this um, to improv, especially for job interviews, interview the interviewer. How many people here got to interview the interviewer in job interviews? Okay, great. Anybody here has never got to interview the interviewer? Ari, Nat, Emmanuel, and some other folks that turned their screen down. I'm gonna, and, and now I'll talk because the photo doesn't count. Uh, I want to throw you away. At least show your face. You don't have to be unmuted. But anybody here has never interviewed the interviewer? And I don't mean when the interviewer asked you, do you have any questions? And then you asked a few questions. I mean, when you took the lead on the meeting and asked questions and you were the moderator. Who here has never done it? Be honest. Okay, so for those who did it, what would you say is the difference between job interviews where you literally are the more passive side because you know, they want to interview me or where you took a more leading role in a good way and behave like some sort of like the moderator in some parts and you actually ask questions that they may not have anticipated? What did you learn from your reaction? I'm curious. What do you mean by uh, taking, by like leading the interview? Do you mean by controlling it, the entire aspect of the interview or just asking questions to the interviewer? Well, not the entire aspect, of course. You don't want to be the candidate that takes control of the entire uh, interview meeting. But at least in yeah. some parts, you didn't wait for them to ask you if you have any questions. Um, and you ask questions that they may have not anticipated. Okay, I've done that, done that before. Okay, who else burst in? Marcela, was it you or Jessica? I did. <laughs> okay. I think it's positive. It shows interest and proactivity. So it's a good sign. Anybody here had a negative experience in taking a little bit of the lead in job interviews? Would you mind sharing? Um, I interviewed with a university in San Francisco once and they did not, the people who were interviewing me did not come prepared to the interview. They had five minutes worth of questions. And this is from a person who knows how to give a job interview. So I had to spend the rest of our slot interviewing them. And I also knew if they weren't coming prepared to an interview, that's not an office experience that I would want to work in. So I basically spent it so they wouldn't, uh, tell other colleagues, this guy can't interview was over in five minutes. Okay, so they did, not, they did not know how to improv. Okay, interesting. So you as a candidate, you felt it on the interview were that they lacked that skill and it left a negative impression on you, right? 
Like, I don't want to work in a place that doesn't know how to move beyond, you know, five minutes interview, pre-made questions. Right? Did I understand correctly? Okay. I, uh, I think I also had a bad, kind of a bad, ex uh, kind of like a bad experience. I feel like, I think there was one interview where I asked too much questions in a way that kind of revealed that I was unsure about the job position that I was being interviewed for. And that didn't really go well. Okay, so don't ask too many questions. All right, um, Mikhail asked on the chat, structure. Um, I don't see Mikhail here. Is there a Mikhail in the house? Mikhail Lubanov. If you're here, please explain what you mean by structure. That is a very vague, I mean, I can improv on it, but. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was asked like 10 or 15 minutes ago. All right. <laughs> I think yeah, that was asked no. like 10 minutes ago. Guys, so here's a perfect example. You probably left. So you know, please don't use the chat because it's hard for me to keep track. I'm with you. I'm totally with you. So ask me. Um, okay, great. So I have a question. Yes. Regarding what you said before, because I understand like all the tips you gave, it's like very good like communication techniques. But I don't... Please, Jessica, could you please just speak slower because I don't hear you so well and maybe some of the others. Okay, sorry. Slower. Okay, so regarding the things you explained before, so I understand them as very like useful uh, communication techniques, but I don't see exactly how it will help me to be like better, like react better, and not to f to regret to say something that I would have have liked said if I like. Like, is this velocity in your mind to be able to reply as you want to reply on what you want to reply? So... Okay. Thank you for sharing. That is exactly why I wanted to really rush through everything to go straight into the practice. So what I would want to do right now, Jessica, is tell you if you feel comfortable, give me like a specific scenario, like, I don't know, tell me which jobs you want to apply to, what happened, or what are you afraid that will happen, and, and let's improv on it to prepare. Mm. But before I do that, yeah. um, how many people here do not know the context of, you know, think like a business unit? Hello, Michael Schwartz from Massa. Okay, maybe it's a ghost. Michael, if you're a ghost, at least <laughs> me, I'm Michael, I'm a ghost. Um, okay, so... Uh, can I give you an example? Can I give you an ex uh, a, uh, a situation? Because, like, unfortunately, yes. I don't have too much time. Um, so hold on. Is it okay with you, Jessica? I'm going to give uh, Ilan to go first, and then I'm back yeah. with you. Only if it's okay with her. Yeah, perfect. I know. For me, it's most, I think, the most common situation I have in interviews, which is why I keep failing, is that I have, like, skills A, B, but I don't have skills C, or I have skills A, but don't have B and C. Okay. But like, I try to show that I'm capable of learning the other skills, but Israel, they have no patience, and they want someone that has already the experience. So how do you okay. positively get through that situation? So another piece you slightly gave me as well, without noticing, you're interviewing in Israel. Culture matters, right? So yeah. Israel, not Japan. No, I'm staying particularly Israel because unfortunately Israel, like when they say an entry level position, it usually means two years experience, not actually right. you Israel. get the job zero experience, which is very, like I had to learn the hard way. Um, okay, so listen, so again, I'm, I'm using the business unit thinking and I'm going to drive this to improv. Um, and again, for those of you who don't know what the business unit idea is, go look it up. There's a ton of content online. There's the previous webinar. I don't want to spend time on it. So thinking like a business unit, Elon, you're the CEO of Elon Incorporated. You're applying for a job, meaning you're going to meet a potential customer. Meaning your job is not, or let's say what you want is not just to get the job. Getting the job is not the end. It's the beginning. And if it's the wrong job, then you failed. And if it's the right job and you suck to the interview, then you failed. So my approach would be when you go to interviews, especially in Israel, go to them as if you were a freelancer and you, look, you have only a slot for one customer and that could be them, like your full-time job, okay? What does that mean when you go to an interview? So of course, I mean, I'm not saying be super blunt and ask questions right away, 
But as you answer their questions and they come to see that they want A, B, and C, and all you have is A and B, you lack C, right? Or, or you just have only A and not B and C. Or you just have only A. So here's how, so here's a way we can break the fourth wall or go meta and, you know, drive the conversation forward. So you could say, look, I want to be very honest with you. Um, maybe I'm the right candidate. Maybe I'm not. Maybe it's a good fit. Maybe not. I don't know. My job here is to discover it just as well as you do. I can tell you why I decided to apply for this position, although I saw on LinkedIn that I only have A and not B and C. So you want to come out and say that. I've done that, but it didn't work. Okay. They appreciate the passion, but they wanted the skills. Okay, which happens, right? So another thing you could do is, is it okay if I ask a question, Miss Interviewer or Mr. Interviewer? Yes, yeah, sure. When you decided that you need A, B, and C, why did you decide that it's a must to have A, B, and C at that level of an experience? And they will tell you, listen, we need someone who knows how to deliver on ta-ta-ta-ta-ta. And you would say, okay, and, and just to understand, let's say you have a candidate that knows A and can learn really fast B and C, but also has values like D and E and F. Or you have someone who has only A, B, and C and doesn't really have D and E and F. Would you value the potential of getting someone to learn B and C and the rest as well, or you need those skills right now? It would depend on the company and the situation because sometimes they need it right now. I feel like most of the time they need right now. They don't want to, and plus they don't know you. They don't want to invest in you if they don't know you. Right. So, so that's I the want situation to... I'm in usually. All right. So what I want to do, oh, crap. Uh -huh. I want to jump and show something on my screen. And it, it doesn't have to be completely related to improv, but I, I think I know where you're coming from. So yeah. Uh, um, just... No, but it's just right now, like I'm a computer programmer and I'm uh... I assume. And I, yeah, and I'm uh, like I'm learning the skills I need to learn, but like sometimes like I just don't have all the skills because every company is very specific. Ilan, where are you from? Yeah, Hong Kong originally. Hong Kong. Oh. Yeah, love it. Okay, um, and you're currently on a program, or you're done with the program? And I did a mass. I did a masa program. Uh, I did a masa program before. Okay. Um, I I did it like. Um, um, like almost um, like I did like okay. a you're not program. currently on a MASA program yeah and then okay. I yeah got it but the it last piece of information yeah, I need out. to know the last piece of information I need to know um, are you already in Israel it's just technical are you already I, yeah I'm similar? currently in Israel just so you know for the rest of it it doesn't matter I think like waiting for the citizenship and not getting after your job is a huge mistake you can do it well before but never mind that so here's something for you which could be relevant for others Okay. And then we'll go back to improv. Olin's value in mitigating culture. Look, you could reach out to companies or they reach out to you. And, you know, it could be that, you know, they're looking for A, B, and C. And that's really what they need right now. And, and that's it. Like, what can you do, right? It's a formula. Formula, yep. you either fit in or not. But here's something. There could be a company that is looking for a mobile developer. And who knew they're trying to tap into the APAC market, Asia Pacific market, through a proxy in Hong Kong. Now, what do you know? They're not looking for a marketing lead. They're looking for a mobile developer. But the fact that you're from Hong Kong is not just, you know, the, you know, the culture and you may know Chinese alongside your English. You may know a guy or two, or, you know, your parents are friends with some, you know, who knows? And that's something that they're not looking for. But if through improv, you say, listen, it may be a stupid idea, but, you know, if that adds value, you know, I'd be happy to sit with the marketing team and just, you know, if I can help in a way with your attempt in Hong Kong. And that's something that they're not looking for in terms of, you know, the job interview, but they would value. So you could be a mobile developer and help the marketing team, which works in front of Hong Kong. I would even say, when you look up companies to interview for, look for Israeli companies who are looking for developers and are working with Hong Kong. Because then you have a competitive advantage over Danny Cohen, who could be a better developer than you, but he doesn't know scrap about Hong Kong. So that's a post online. 
you know, go read it out. If you want my advice about it later on, reach out to me in person, okay? Because I want to go back to improv. Okay, what's, uh, wait, what's your, uh, is a way for me to connect to you on LinkedIn or Facebook? Or? Yes, it's very easy. You hit connect with the South Luxembourg. <laughs> yeah. Don't send a bullshit blank request. This is something we discussed in previous, uh, I'm not going to talk about networking here, although I don't mind talking about anything, but guys, please don't send bullshit blank connection requests. Add a personal note. You know what it feels like if you go to a business conference, you know, those things we used to have before Corona, and someone would reach out to you and give you a business card like this and not say a goddamn thing. And you're looking, you know, at your friend, you know, what that person that gave you, like, who the hell is he? Why is he giving me a card and not speaking? That's you sending black connection requests on LinkedIn. Okay? Add what's, your, notes. what's your name on uh, LinkedIn again? Asaf Luxembourg. Just Google Asaf. my name. Yeah, so ask me in person because I want to go back to improv unless you want to uh, practice improv. You, you said you had to go, so I want to... Unfortunately, I have to head out now, but uh, I, I guess I'll take, talk to you later about it. Listen, take your cultural assets and turn them into a competitive advantage. Not necessarily to every company, but for the top 10 companies that you may want to reach to anyhow because they work with Hong Kong. And, you know, they would want to have someone less experienced, but who knows Hong Kong, even though he's a developer, but could help the marketing team. I hope that gives you an idea. Well, I've, I've done it before, but I'll, I'll talk to you later about it. Okay, great. So give me more details later. Yeah, yeah. fine. Jessica, back to you, right? I owe you one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so back to you. Give me the context again. No, actually, in the job, it's not, it, it was more interesting for me, like in, I don't know, maybe social context or any kind of situation in life. Uh, like to be able to to respond like quickly and like be I don't know for example when some I will give a very stupid example but for example someone makes a joke and you want to respond like also but I just laugh like I yeah I don't have like you don't know what to say yeah I don't have a cute quick comeback you know so right so how, way, how do I develop the the agility in my mind to yeah. So how do you develop? First of all, some people are born with it. Some people are not. I was not born with it. I was not very, you know, outgoing and external and creative and know what to say right away. I practiced, um, which is the optimistic side. You can practice it. You can't practice every scenario. Like if someone says, right. joke A, I will respond with joke B, right? Mm -hmm. But what Improv does, and I really want to get to more uh, exercise. I love your questions, but I would love to do some exercise too. Um, improv allows you to think faster because you're not trying to think mm -hmm. of specific situations. You're trying to think of context. You're, the neurons in your mind, you know, they work more freely because you're not thinking about like a car that drives in a lane. You're looking at a landscape. And then you understand you don't always have to respond to something funny with something funny, for example. Um, so that's one thing. Um, so it's practice, practice how? <laughs> but let's talk about more career stuff. So, you know, give me okay. some team meeting or in the internship or job interviews, which I guess, you know, is something you all think about. Um, anybody here is a freelancer, by the way. So it's not job interviews, it's potential customers. Okay, so job interviews. Um, who here faced a situation where you didn't know what to say in a job interview? Would you mind sharing, Julia maybe, or Anna? You don't need to give me all the details, just, you know, the context. Julia, Anna? I don't remember the situation right now. I'm sure, I'm sure it happened, but, um, like, you, you blank or something, but... I don't remember a situation right now where that happened. Okay. I'm sure it happened, but I remember when, you know. How many people here are about to go into job interviews or you're doing job interviews right now? Okay. Um, what are your concerns? Like, what are you afraid that would happen in a job interview that you would like to know how to improv and you don't know how? I'm afraid that uh, I will be asked some question and... I wouldn't come up with an answer and like, you know, this weird situation when we're sitting in front of each other or in the Zoom and like waiting. 
Yeah, like you can tell them, okay, I'll get back to you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So what have you tried so far? I don't want to jump to the answer yet. What have you tried so far? So far, I'm preparing really well. I'm writing like my speech and uh, I went through a lot of interviews like in the previous time. So I'm writing down all the questions and I'm kind of trying to, you know, predict. <laughs> okay. So you're basically working on your pitch when they tell you, okay, tell us about yourself. You need like two minutes and they need to be like the good two minutes, right? Yeah, this definitely like about right. myself is prepared. And it's a great thing to do because these are the two minutes that you actually totally control. And the way you storytell yourself is very effective. It would also give you confidence to later on Say, for example, if they throw a question at you and you say, you know what, honestly, I, I don't really know. It's an, it's an interesting question. I need to think about it. It builds trust. So you can't use it all the time, but using it once in an interview, they say, okay, here's someone who's not just playing us. You know, they're, they're genuine. Um, so what I want to tell you, and again, to save time, if you go to the previous, you know what, let's do this just so we could jump forward to other people. Um, by the way, is Michael still here? No. 19, uh, okay, he left. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so again, um, just to give you something for later on, if you go to LinkedIn, or it was also in Times of Israel, and you literally, if you just go to my profile, you know what, let's do this. If you go to my profile, you will see this, blah, 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 blah. boom. Don't miss your Corona crisis opportunity. This is the post I wrote, which was the precursor to the, uh, um, the previous webinar. So you hit here, you go here, even if you don't wanna read the full post, forget about that. Um, here you have like the full webinar. There are some others as well, but here you have like short clips. Like I, I literally took like two, three minutes Cut them, question, answer, and posted them here. So for you, uh, where are you, Anna? Um, storytelling advice for entrepreneurs, for example. There's more than one version of it here. Um, I would advise you to look at that because you could use that for you. Meaning, how do you tell your story in two minutes in a way that leads to why you chose to apply for that job? So it's not just, you know, generally get to know me and my hobbies. It's also my story, what I've done so far, and what led me to really want to apply for this job. And then it's pretty likely that the questions they will ask, they may have some technical questions they're gonna ask anyhow, but the other ones will be related for the way you told the story. So it will help you improv in a better way. A few times I'm just facing the situation when the, this question, uh, tell me about yourself, it's in the end. And then in the beginning, they answer, they ask those very specific questions. For example, I just come up like uh, how you deal with in the stress situation at work, mm -hmm. how you deal when you argue with someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these are the questions you are uh, concerned about uh, getting stuck? Okay. Yeah, most so um, a few things you could do. First of all, again, I'm not saying don't practice. So practice, like Google, you know, most common questions on job interview. Get a list, think of what to say about them. Obviously, you need to think about one example where you led something. Obviously, you need to think about one example where you failed in something. It doesn't have to be something big. Um, obviously, it has to be with something, you know, I sometimes ask when I interview, Tell me about an incident where your boss said X and you really believe that Y and you try to convince your boss that your boss is stupid and wrong and you're right. And, you know, how did that work? Yeah, exactly. That's the question. Right. I don't know how to answer that. So, listen, you could say, very honestly, listen, you know, I don't remember anything that happened exactly like that. But you know what? It reminds me of a story that I had in the internship last year. See, so that's a way to use yes and. We spoke about yes and as a tool. So you're not saying, you know, never happened to me, and then you block, right? You use the question to drive to the next thing. It reminds you of a story that is kind of similar about X, Y, and Z. Okay? I could go on and give examples, but that's one way of doing it. So 
do think of yourself, I mean, obviously, I mean, most likely the interviewer went to Google, you know, right? Like a year ago when she was redesigning the interview process for her company. Hmm, let, how can we do a better interview process? Google, most common, I don't know, top interview questions to ask candidates. It's, it's the same YouTube video you could watch. So do it. I would say go meta and break the fourth wall you, and you say, you know what? It's interesting you asked that question because I actually looked at a YouTube video, you know, top you know, questions for interviews and it was one of them. And I thought, should I say the story about X or the story about Y? And you know what? I think I'm going to tell you something completely different because of what you told me about your company. There was one time uh, where I worked a lot of, and, and you go there. So I just revealed information about how I went and did market research, which questions are the best. And I came across that video and she may smile because who knows, it's the same video she saw. And, and although you told yourself, you know, mm, I could talk about this experience or that experience, you know what, Michelle, since you told me that your company is in blah, 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 you know what, five years ago, there was an incident and you build trust because you, show her you talk about something you did not plan to talk about. Plus, that whole story took you 20 seconds. 20 seconds is a lot of time to think. Okay, so that's a way to use improv. Next. Um, so something that I'm worried about whenever I have to improv in an interview is that the interviewer will tell that that's happening and think to themselves, okay, so this guy is lying to me. What are ways to make sure that doesn't happen? Okay, so honesty and trust are way more important than showing that you fit professionally, in my mind, right? There are some companies where you wanna be the asshole liar that just knows the jobs the best. I hope you're not applying for those places, right? Um, but, Give me, some, give me a little bit more context. So what do you mean when you say like the interviewer will think that I'm lying? Exactly that. I, am, I don't have Why would more she context. think that you're lying? I mean, I'm not, but I'd imagine there's certain things that you might say while improv or anything like that that would trigger that in the interviewer. Okay. I have a scenario, if that helps. Um, basically, I'm changing fields right now, and I'm mm -hmm. going for entry level jobs. So, uh, whenever interview entry level jobs. Okay. So basically, when an interviewer asks me like, "Why do you want to work here?" and like, "With your background, that doesn't make sense to me." Blah blah blah. And like, I try to justify it, but like sometimes it's not my dream job, and they can. Right. Maybe sense that I'm lying about it or something. Can I ask you a question, Marcella? Or yes. Stan or anybody else? Deep inside, when, when you applied for that job, while you are, you know, it's more related to you, I guess. When you were, Marcella, when you were pivoting, you're pivoting your career and you say, you know what, I should apply for X and you get the job interview. If deep inside, you don't really want that opportunity, a good interview will know to smell it out. But so, sometimes you don't have the luck to choose. You have to apply to right. multiple questions. So what I would do again, use improv tools to build trust. So what I would do again is using the same tricks, I would do something like, and again, I don't know the context, you know, God is in the details, but generally speaking, and take this with a grain of salt, I would do this. You know, Michelle, when I looked at the job description, since you know my experience is in X and I want to pivot to Y. I know you're kind of looking for Z, and Z is more close to Y than X, but it's not 100% what I was looking for that I told you that I want. And I, I know that. The reason I decided to apply for this opportunity anyhow is because I'm thinking that maybe someone like me could also do X, Y, and Z. I broke the fourth wall. I went meta, right? And I bought time to think, so I improvised. And again, based on your details, I can share your story. You know what? I'll share a real story from my background. Unless someone wants to ask something completely different, I'll, sh I'll share an example. So 400,000 years ago, when I was younger, um, um, it wasn't a career pivot, but I basically was part of a venture or a project. 
And I decided I'm, I'm, I don't want to stay here. I want to jump ship before this thing goes down because I don't believe in the way it's managed and morale and values and never mind. Not my style. I want out. And this was before I started my own business. And, but I was already doing it on the side for free, internships, speaking engagements, and the whole thing, uh, a little bit of consulting. And I went to a job interview for a company and never mind what the name of the company was. And when I applied, I told them, you know, at a certain point in the interview, they told me, okay, so, so why did you decide to apply? And I basically told them, listen, I, I guess, like, if I were you, I guess I'm a little bit overqualified. And if I were you, maybe I would not even invite me because, you know, why would we want to take someone overqualified? The minute they find something better, they will leave. Why invest in such a candidate? I guess that's something, Jessica, you relate to, right? You asked about pivoting careers. No, well, Anna, sorry. Right? Who asked about that? Like being the overqualified us. Oh, so it's still you, Marcel. Okay. So I came out and said that. That's not improv. That's just a sales tactic. So I assumed what their concern was, and I was the fourth coming to put it on the table in a nice way and put it, look, I'm guessing this is a concern you would have. I would have it if I were you. So I want to tell you what it was I thinking when I applied for this job interview. I can tell you what my answer was. It will not necessarily be your answer, um, but that answer got them to be convinced to take me. And the interview was more of like a business meeting, meaning me and them coming to terms about how it's going to work than accept me or not accept me. Was that clear? So the general idea here is this. If you have certain concerns when you apply for a job and you get the job interview, my advice is you be the one to put the concern on the table. Even if the interview goes well, I would even say that, you know, um, uh, you know, Ronit, you know, uh, um, I actually wanted to say something. We didn't talk about it. But, you know, if I need to think like you, I would have a concern about me. Blah, 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 blah. And I want to put it on the table. And maybe it's not a concern. But if it is, I want to tell you what would be my answer if you asked me about it. And shut up. And let her respond or him respond. Maybe he'll say, ah, don't worry about it. Or maybe say, you know what, I'm interested. What would you say if I were to ask you this? But going that route is some sort of an improv that builds trust. Don't wait for them to ask you, what are your uh, um, disadvantages, right? If you are the one who puts it on the table, not always it's possible. Maybe they ask all the questions and they give you five minutes in the end. It may happen, Jonathan. But many interviews would be very different. Um, and it also depends on how you apply. When you apply directly and you come through the door, you may get the standard interview. And if you came through the door and you got the interview, it means that they really believed in you as a candidate because they get 10,000 CVs and you're one of the 10 that they chose. So 10 out of 10,000. That's a one in a thousand. So good for you. When you come out the window, and there are ways to get job interviews by coming through the window, not come out the window, come through the window, um, then the interview is being conducted differently. Go to that blog post, look for that part about don't look for a job, biz dev, don't just apply for jobs, reach out to companies you wanna work for, don't talk to HR, go to the head of product, reach out to him on LinkedIn, ask him a question that is not, you know, I wanna work for you, not that, but ask him a question that, you know, hmm, interesting. Why do you ask? And that's how you can get that job interview. And that job interview would be different than the template one in many cases. So I threw a lot of additional advices here. But the main one would be you put their concerns or what you believe their concerns are on the table. Which kind of leads me to the one point that I didn't really talk about yet, which is how to own the internship in terms of at least at certain parts you be the interviewer. But I'm putting that aside for a little bit. Anybody has other questions? Who here has an upcoming job interview? Or it could be a team meeting that 
I don't know, your friend, or you have to present something to your boss or something like that, and you would like to practice maybe. Okay, if there is something, please burst in. Um, I don't remember if we scheduled one hour or 90 minutes. Um, let me check my calendar for a second. It's until 7.30, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, great, so we have more time. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, questions that you may want to ask when you interview. Because in my mind, there is no such thing as going for a job interview. You're going to a sales meeting and you want to make sure if they are the right customer for you. So one of the things I like advising others to ask, or when I used to ask myself in the last times that I interviewed, um, because I run my own business, I, I don't interview a job interview with my, myself, but I, but I do interview others. So one question that I like to receive from interviewees is, um, it goes like this. So what is important for you in this position? And then what, they, they'll say something blurry and you know, very generic and you know, mundane. And then you say, okay, what will count as a success? Like, let's say you hire not me, someone else, the best candidate. What counts as success? A year from now, what is that developer doing that you don't have yet? If that's an intern, well, nobody here is applying for an internship, but for the millions who may watch this online or whatever, like, let's say you apply for an internship interview, which is limited in time, it's three months. For many of you in the future, you will apply for a project that is three months as you'll start your own business and you're applying for a project, which is three months. Or as an employee of your customer, you, customer as an employee of your company, you would go and talk to customers who may hire, hire you and your company for three months. So it's limited in time. And you say, okay, so for this project, what is the main goal? What counts as success? What do we have three months from now that we don't have yet? Don't talk about responsibilities and authorities and what do you do at work? Talk about the results of your work. Because thinking like a business unit, a business unit, no, I can't take that call right now. Thinking like a business unit, that's what your customer cares about. Nobody is hiring you because they need another employee. People consider hiring you because they have something to do that is so important for them and they have so little time to think about and care about that they'd rather pay someone to do it for them. Does that make sense? So any job description for any opening is born out of a certain customer pain. The company you apply for has a certain pain. There's a certain amount of work that is not getting done, so we need to bring another person, which we will need to pay for and teach and incorporate into the team and give them the laptop. And it's, it's a pain. Hiring is pain. But we can't avoid it. Having someone to do it is that important. You want to tap into that pain. So we move from improv to questions you want to ask, um, even if it's in the last five minutes, five minutes. But you want to show that you're proactive, you think businessy, and you understand. No, my dear son, I can't take your call right now. And you can't, um, and, and you really understand them. You're doing the John Malkovich. And you're not trying to get the job so you would get their money as a monthly salary so you will be good. It's not about you. It's about them and what you do for them. This is a business marketing sales thinking. Most candidates don't really take that approach. They think, what do I need to answer so that they would pick me so that I will get the job? Hence, I will have a salary and it will make me happy and I will have money because it's me, 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 me. And the minute you show them that you think about them, it puts you in a different position, even if you don't have all the skills, Jonathan. So what is your goal in this hiring? What will count as success for the right candidate to join on board? What would you want to happen in the next three months, six months, by the end of the year? Um, without getting into names, did you have someone that did that position? Were you happy with what he or she did? 
because maybe they fired that person and you know threw them off, or maybe they had the best person in the world, but she left for maternity leave. You want to understand what is their you know history with that specific need. Um, so these are questions that I really advise on asking. Goal: What counts? As, what are your goals? What counts as success? What happened before without getting into too much details? Um, then you could tweak in what you don't have. So listen, obviously I don't have B and C, but I, I, I mean, I can tell you that I, I'm a fast learner and I can tell you all the things that probably other candidates tell you as well. I can also tell you that since I came from Hong Kong and I know you guys are working in Asia, you know, if, if there's something I could help with my Chinese, I would be happy to. You didn't say that you want it, but I'm happy to offer it. Is that important? I mean, is that relevant? And shut up. And then you get them to think, huh, maybe we should skip a little bit outside that template of what we were looking to hire and see who's in front of us. Does that make sense, Jonathan? Yes. Um, I'm confused why you're referring to me specifically, though. I did not I don't remember if question. you're the guy from... I'm not from Hong Kong. Different men. I know. Uh, I'm American. Uh, that's okay. I believe Elon is gone. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm blurring you all out. I mean, you're all one person to me. You're from Hong Kong, and you're American, and you're a developer, and you're... Oh, I'm definitely not a developer. Of, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm joking. I, I work in education. We're as far from high tech so far as I can get in this country. And you would be surprised. Um, so let's do that. Okay, great. So even if it's in the last few minutes, um, insist on asking a few questions yourself just to show how do you think and how you try to tap into their needs. Sometimes you would have time for more questions, I highly advise you ask more questions, not too much like someone said over here. So again, improvise. If you have like a list of questions and hmm, these are good questions to ask as a candidate, because I went to YouTube and, and, and search, what are the best questions to ask as a candidate in job interviews? You will not get to ask all 10, but you will get to ask five out of 10. Um, so that's the one point I wanted to mention. Again, I'm improvising here, so it's not really related to improv, but it's super important for job interviews. Questions? It's not really a question, but I think it's also important like, to develop the, like, the self-knowledge, uh, to know like, also which organization is good for you, regardless of what they think that like, you also have to uh, ask about how is the culture of the company, how is the structure, so you have to to be able to know if it is a good place also for you, not just like if they choose you. You have no idea how much you are right, Jessica. That's exactly what I talk about when I'm talking about, where is it? Uh, don't look for a job biz dev or how to manage your boss like a customer or um, you know, all of the, a lot of the stuff that is in here. Um, again, I couldn't repeat this enough, but I'm not gonna get into the whole spiel. The more you think of yourselves as if you are the CEO of you and you're interested in working with that company, even though you know you don't have everything that they said they need, and even though you could be overqualified, but there's an emotional reason why you want to work there. If you're able to communicate that emotional reason, it could turn the interview into uh, uh, one where you have much more control, you'll feel much more comfortable, and you'll feel much more natural improvising. It will not even be improvising, it will just be a conversation. Uh, I came to see that with developers, with marketing people, with, with almost anything. And again, the more you break the fourth wall and go meta, it 
builds this idea that you're not sitting in front of them, you're sitting with them. This is not a job interview, it's just a conversation. Um, so it's less technical. Um, the more you go there, the better. Who else I, have has a I have a question. Hi, Galit. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned to try to think from the perspective of the company you're interviewing with. So I was trying to do that in the context of education. Like, let's say in the Israeli system, like you're going for a job and you had mentioned to try to think like, what need are they trying to fill? I hope it's okay to ask, are you MITF? Yeah. Jonathan, are you MITF? Okay. So I'm assuming like multiple of us are like in the field of education okay. because this was advertised to MITF. So I was just wondering if you might be able to improv like a t like specifically that, like you're at an interview to be a teacher and how would I think through like the logic of how the school needs to fulfill the right. need, you know, or is it the district or is it the country? Right. Or so, Jonathan, you didn't give me the full context, but since you told me you're MITF, I know you're speaking about education from the context of teaching, right? Because Yes. For the program. So maybe that's the job interviews you're also looking for. Jonathan, education could be ed tech. So, you know, give me a little bit more context later on. Because, Rani, you're the developer? No. Okay, so uh, I'm confusing again. So education could be a lot of things that are not necessarily teaching up front. But right. back to you, and then I'll be happy to go back to you, Jonathan. Um, schools are very um, um, bureaucratic organizations. I mean, it's got, it, at the end of the day, it's government. I mean, there's probably a certain template that the interviewer must fill in, even if they hate that template. Uh, there's a certain process that you have to go through, even if people hate that process. I mean, it's like corporates, right? That's the way they do stuff. Not going to change it. But many times you're going to interview in small companies where there is no real process. And then you want to be as much uh, um, um, forward and reaching and, you know, taking the business unit approach. But I would say that even in schools, it's the same. So I think the business unit thinking applies to all. When you reach out to a school, what is most important for the person who is hiring you, which is probably the principal and one of the teachers sitting with you. What is the most important trait for a kind of job where they're kind of have to put you in front of students without being there and they're gonna to have to do it pretty much right away? What do they need? Um, I mean, if I, I would imagine if I was a principal in that situation, I would, want to hear that somebody has experience mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and uh, confidence, right? Experience. But what is the most important thing? Confidence and experience are, are important, not to say the least. But what is also very important for the kind of job where you're not next to your boss all day, you're in the field. It means that I mean, just a general resp responsible person? Is that what you're getting at? Right, because they need to do what with you? With they, me, the principal? No, I mean, if, if you're applying for a job and the principal and one of the uh, veteran teachers they have, are hiring they have to trust you. trust me. They have to trust me? Trust. Yeah. So again, I'm using sales techniques for job interviews because I believe that there is no such thing as a job interview. You're selling the school, Galit Incorporated. And trust is maybe the best carrier for sales, much more than experience, much more than confidence. You would not, I assume, you may not take the most experienced lawyer, accountant, doctor, psychologist. You would take the one you trust the most. Once you understand that with them, if you get them to see that you are someone they can trust, it matters less if you have all five things that they're looking for or just four. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That's why you want to go for trust. And even in schools, you know what? 
thinking from a school perspective, they need to fill in the forms. There's due process. They must show X, Y, and Z. You know, the system is on the on day long, you know, report, report. I mean, you know how it is. You saw the backstage of how a school is like. I mean, most of the time they're not busy teaching kids. They're busy fighting the systems to get a, a little, at least a little bit of independence to do something good because the system is on them all day long. I mean, that's, sometimes that's how it looks like from behind the scenes. So once you tap into that and you show them that you don't know everything and you may do a little bit of mistakes, but you're humble and you can learn and you know how to learn fast because you're confident, but you're trustworthy then what happens is you, you realize that what you really sell them is not what they're looking for in the job description. What you really sell to them is peace of mind. And the more you try to go there, you will feel like the less they really care about. Like they may say at a certain point, you know what, listen, you know, you don't have that characteristic and you don't have the right amount of experience and we will need to factor this into account so you know what let's start on a part-time basis let's do a one month trial and see how it works just because they were able to feel a certain amount of trust with you yeah got it that really really helps I'm you maybe it's a universal again i know we're diverting from improv but it's more important the more you will try to deploy sales not even tricks, like a sales mentality, not sales in a sleazy way, you know, buy this for $9.99. No, sales in a way of, you know, really making the customer want to work with you, the customer, not the potential employer, then the terms could be different. And you know what? We actually started interviewing you for this role, but listen, we're going to take someone else, but you could really help in that place. Now, if you're interviewing for a company you really want to work for, it matters less if you're going to do this role or that role. Right. Right? Yeah. I hope that helped. It really helped. Thank you so much. Great. I appreciate it. Jonathan, back to you. You want to give me a little bit more context just because I feel like I owe you a more specific answer. And then I want to move okay. to Okay. Yes. Um, my background is in educational psychology, working with new college students. However, okay. I am not a licensed therapist and I am not a certified teacher. My p past experience is working, for example, in student housing and LGBT centers, usually with um, programming, um, workshops. So correct me if I'm wrong, I, I heard you a little bit, you were kind of broken on my side, but you're kind of some sort of a counselor, that's where... No, I am not a licensed therapist and I am not a certified teacher. I work outside the classroom, usually uh, in the past that has been in student housing and in LGBT centers, mostly with programming and educational efforts. As a counselor, not a professional therapist? Sure. Gotcha. Let me share you, some, you know, something from my world, okay? So when I took the business unit thinking and the whole pitch of how to hack the new world of work and I tailored it to Masa program and that started something like three years ago. And I don't want to take you through that story and how I believe this is big, big, big and relevant to the future. When I started that, I came to programs that I work with who bring me to work with their Masa candidates. Okay, so what, what's happening? I'm not trying to sell you like come to me to my coaching class. I'm not a coach. But there are programs who bring me to work with their candidates as a side counselor. I'm not the official internship boss and I'm not the program manager. I am the third party. Make sense? The way I did that is by saying, listen, I don't claim to be a coach. I don't want to be a coach. I don't claim to be a professional, you know, the professional guide or the teacher for that matter. I don't want to be. I don't have the license. If you're looking for that, I am not your guy. My approach is to come and be like the older brother. So that's what I told some of the programs that I work with. I want to take an older brother approach. Now, you go to your parents to certain things because officially they're in charge of you when you're a kid but you would go to your older sibling when you need some sort of a you know, third party tip maybe. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, sometimes they need that certificate. It means that you didn't qualify the place you're interviewing for enough, right? 
if this was a business and we were to go and try to sell to a company together, right? Like here's a company we want to sell our services to. We reach out to them. We get them interested. We get to the meeting and we realize that we do things that are totally irrelevant for them because they need something very specific that it's not us. We, we, like we could have saved that time if we would have checked before, right? So um, to wrap up my answer, the answer is I advise on the older brother approach. It worked for me. It will not work for the wrong potential customers. It will work with the right potential customers. So you want to burn out the wrong ones in advance and get to the right ones faster. But this goes back to don't look for a job biz dev, which is one of those you know, links that I showed before in the post. Uh, so there's a lot of it online, which basically means, guys, it's great that you apply for jobs. Brrr, spray the hill, send 150 applications. You'll get 10 replies. Seven of them will be rejections. Three will be a maybes. One of them will be a yes. One in 150. That's how it works today from what I came to learn from the field. I'm not a professional. I'm just a Bedouin helping Bedouins. That's why I learned from other Bedouins. 100 to 150 depends on the context. That's when you go and see who is hiring and who could I fit. Another thing you could do is say, okay, in a perfect world, everybody pays the same. In a perfect world, the reputation is the same. CEO of Google and cleaning the street is both admirable in that perfect world. And in a perfect world, the risk management is the same. Small startup, big enterprise, same risk. And in a perfect world, everybody wants me now. So in that perfect world, when I take all that arguments and turn them into constants in that mathematical equation, the one variable that remains is, where do I want to work? in such an imagined reality. Ask yourself that question, and then open Excel, column A, name of company, one, two, three, four, 10, top 10. Column B, right, it's the same A or B, I don't know. Column A, column B, right? So it's opposite for B, good for you. Column A, column B. Column B is my why. Simon Sinek, start with why. Some of you know this, some of you don't. Look it up. Let's use Simon Sinek, start with why. My why, for company number one, why do I really want to work there if all things being equal in the perfect world? Company number two, company number three, what is my why? Do I like the product? Do I like the company? Do I admire the founder? Do I love the way they communicate and market? And I'm a marketer, so I want to be part of that team. What is the emotional reason that you want to be part of their tribe? Emotional human. Because all the technical is, you know, constant. Column C is their why. So if they couldn't care less about what you want to be with them, why should they want someone like you? It could be related for a job description that they published right now because they're hiring. It could not. Why should they be interested in having someone like you on board? Company name, my why, their why, multiply by 10, you have the top 10. Now go to LinkedIn, Re, you know, go to those companies, look at the company page, see who works there, see who do you know. And then you'll come across Michelle from HR. However, unless you want to work in HR, because HR is part of your why, if you want to work in the, I don't know, the marketing department, reach out to the marketing director. Because they're not in the hiring business. They're in the, you know, have the best people on board my team business. Reach out to the marketing director in a smart way. In the videos, I show examples about, you know, how to do it. And once you establish a relationship, like you give them a tip, you found a typo in their website, you give them an idea for the next campaign, whatever it is, ask for two minutes to ask for an advice. And based on that advice, and I show that on the videos, get them intrigued into maybe, you know, it's worth, you know, discussing with you. Maybe there's something we can do together. And believe me, they know how to go to Michelle from HR and tell them, listen, remember Ruth? Remember we said we want to get rid of her again and she's not delivering anymore and she's tired, but, they, but she's still good and we're kind of stuck. I think we have the next person. You never know. You never know. 
don't think getting a job, think about sales. Don't look for a job, business. So it's all online. More questions. Who here wants to practice something that happened to you in a job interview and you got stuck? Um, of course, it's not you, it's a friend of yours. It never happened to you. It's just an imaginary situation. Let's try to play a game, okay? We have a few minutes left. Let's try to play a game. Um, you be the interviewer and I'll try to be the interviewee. Um, how would you say, I mean, you take more job interviews than me. I, I, I interview a little bit, but you take job interviews. How does a job interview start? What would you say are the, the first thing that the interviewer says? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Who here disagrees? Or maybe- How are you? I would, ask, I would ask, how are you? Okay, how are you? Of course, like small talk. What would you say is the first thing professionally? Tell us about yourself or something professional. I would say something more specific, like tell me what you did in the company X and why do you want to live in the company X, why, why you were right. required. So we saw on your CV that you worked at blah, 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 and you left. So can you share with us what happened? That. Anybody ever had a challenge with that part so far? So these are general questions of them getting to know you. Great. So none of you had any challenges. Let's move on. I will say, look at the storytelling uh, video, like how to tell your story in two minutes. It's, I think the video is for entrepreneurs, but convert it for you. There's a way to tell your story, which is not general, but lead them to why you chose to apply for that job. The emotional reason, your why. It will change, it could change the course of the interview. Okay, so we're past that. So you, I tell you a little bit about myself and why I decided that I'm willing to make even less than what I could just because I want to get more experience in that field. And if a company can benefit from my extra experience when I was a lawyer and now I want to be an accountant, fine. But, you know, um, I really want that pivot. It's important for me for my career. Um, so let's say we're done with that and I'm done telling you about myself and why did I decide to apply for just job interview? What would you as the interviewer ask me next? I freaking forget answer. Like, tell me about your uh, daily, daily work, daily courses. No, let me open. I mean, you're totally right. Um, let me even open a job interview. Hold on. I have it in handy. I don't want to waste too much time. Screw it. Okay, I'll continue and I'll bring this up. A few questions that some of you may have encountered. Um, how many of you got asked about what do you want regardless of this job? Like, what's your dream in life? Who got asked? Never been asked. Okay. That's something that if you do get asked, I mean, you do want to be honest. Like when someone says to me, my dream was to work in your startup since ever. Well, we didn't exist three years ago. How could this be your dream? So don't try to bullshit them. Um, hold on, I'm getting to what I'm looking for. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, you do want to communicate your career dream. In that other webinar, I talked a little bit about how your job is not necessarily your career. It's part of the business unit idea. Job is for the next year or two. Career is the path you're doing in your professional life. Career is made out of jobs, but a random sequence of job is not a career. So I decided to apply for this job because in a way it helps me promote my career goals. That's a language I would advise you to use. You kind of turn this into like a job interview session. That's fine by me. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to get to this thing right here. Plus nine. So no, no. no. Uh, right. Okay. Great. So a few questions. If you don't get asked about what are your dreams, what is your career goal? Like what do you want to do in 20 years? 
you may want to proactively communicate that. So what else do you want us to know about you? Well, I do want to tell you that if you look at my CV, it kind of looks like I'm trying to pursue a career in X. And to be honest, it's kind of true. Like in the long run, I do want to be in the X business. But I understand that in order to be successful in the X business, I also need experience in the Y industry. And that's why I decided to apply for this job. Because for me, that experience is worth gold in the future. Now, I do understand that, and or I think that the fact that I have experience in X coming to a company that is in Y could bring value. I don't know if I'm right or not. I'm, I'm happy to learn from you, but that's part of what I was thinking of. Why could I be a, an interesting candidate? What I did right now is try to align the goals between the two sides. So to explain why did I decide to apply, to show them how they serve my purpose in the long run, which is why I will be incentivized to work hard, be willing to come towards them, blood, sweat, and tears, and will not run away in three months just because I received something better. It's not just the money. So it builds trust. It's breaking the fourth wall. It's sharing from the backstage of your mind. Um, and it aligns the interest, alignment of interest. Um, I also gave them a reason why they should hire someone like me, even if they didn't think about that. You know what? It's interesting that you're from Hong Kong. We didn't think about that, but if someone could help the team specifically with Asia, we will never hire someone to be an Asia marketer, but you could help a little bit to the other department. Not a bad idea. Let us think about it. You just sold them another need. Does that make sense? So communicate your long-term goals. Another one, um, tell, me an, tell me about an incident where things went wrong and how did you react? So these are questions that are sometimes, anybody got asked about that? Okay, so you do want to have an answer ready. And my way would be, listen, you know, there's something that happened to me a few years ago, which is usually what I'm sharing in interviews when I get asked that question. But since you told me about you know, what you do right now, I kind of want to talk about um, another experience that I actually had in school, not at work. So, you know what? I, I think I'm going to go with the school example, if that's okay with you. So you share with them your deliberation in, in which example to use. Builds trust. Bought you some time. They choose. You know what? No, tell us about work, not about school. Great. They chose. It's just an improv trick. Make sense? Great, but you do want to have at least one incident ready to, um, uh, to use. Here's another one. We're running out of time. Um, what did you want three years ago and what happened? Like, what did you want for your career? Which jobs were you looking for three years ago and what happened? We want to see if your ambition changes. So communicate that and say, you know what, actually, so pivot or not pivot your deliberations, but you do know that for the short term, which is the next two or three years, you really want to be devoted into something that is X, Y, and Z. Show them potential commitment. What are the interviewers afraid of? That they're going to hire a good person and they're going to leave, right? Or they're going to hire the wrong person and it's going to be a hard time making them leave. So diffuse their worries. Um, here's another one. What is the most complex, complex thing you ever faced? And what did you do? How did you, found, did you face that challenge? It would be personal, professional, whatever. Tell me about a project you led. Um, here's the one I mentioned before. Have it, has it ever happened to you that you thought X, your boss thought Y, and what did you do? They want to see if you were playing, you know, teddy bear no-no or whatever that's called, like you're not going to do it if it's not your way, or you're just a yes man that will do whatever the boss says and will not think independently. So you want to show that you will try to persuade, but if the call is to do X, you're going to do X the best way you can, right? It's important for them. Um, so these are questions that you do want to prepare for. My advice would be, even if you have that answer ready, try to improvise on it. Breaking the fourth wall, using yes and, we didn't discuss uh, team meetings, but when, when, when there's like a brainstorming or in the teacher's room in the school, um, 
Don't say, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea because say, you know what? I think it's a great idea. Maybe it even could be greater if. So that kind of language. Go meta and breaking the fourth wall is maybe the most important tip. I repeat it a few times today. Try to agree, disagree, and say, I don't know. Um, if it fits, let's say they give you a case study in the interview. Um, and you say, we were thinking of doing X. What do, you, what do you think? So you say, you know what? I think it could be good here. I don't know if, if it will be good here. And um, I, think, I don't think it will be a good example here. You know, so a combination of them. Um, and try to ask the right questions and interview the interviewer. With your questions, you have the opportunity to sell trust and peace of mind, which I would argue is way more important than professional traits. I could teach you how to do X, Y, and Z, but I can't teach you how to be an honest and sincere and trustworthy person. That you need to sell to me, the interviewer. I'm the customer, you're the business unit. Objections, questions. We agree with everything. <laughs> Okay, that was a pretty long spiel for the beginning because I wanted to wrap this thing all up. Uh, we, did, we didn't really do long uh, uh, improvs and that's okay, but I hope at least the Q&A was relevant to you guys. I will say what I said in the uh, last uh, webinar because it's even truer today than it was back then. Um, I do believe that the corona crisis provides a lot of opportunities if you think uh, um, in a more creative way and more like in a business unit way. Um, I try to give general tips because a lot of the practical tips are online in that post. So I do advise you to go look it up. And I do invite you to reach out to me um, through the website, email, LinkedIn, Twitter, anywhere about Facebook and Instagram, really. Um, yeah, reach out. I would be happy to take it to a more individual level. Um, thank you for coming. I hope this was relevant. And go out there and get yours. There has never been a better time in terms of the, what's happening right now to reach out to people who would usually would not reply to you. The window is closing. Time window is closing. Don't miss that opportunity. Put that seed for a relationship which could lead to that Zoom five-minute call, which could lead to that unexpected 30-minute Zoom meeting call, which you didn't think is a job interview, but then they, you got the phone call. You never know. So don't look for a job. Please, Dev. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the energy. <laughs> very, Thank very cool. You. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you coming. Bye. Bye. Bye.